that will hopefully inform us um, in building a sustainable coaching club coaching program. So in that section, we look at you know key areas that you might want to develop within your club in terms of coaching. And we'll talk about how we can ensure that those uh, programs and those uh, structures are sustainable and uh, last. And finally, we'll just finish off uh, with in the short term and you know with with the with the climate we're in at the moment it's it's very very uncertain maybe but what are the things we can do in the short term as coaches to uh, keep developing our coaching program and also keep engaging with our players which is which is really important at a time like this so let's go very very quickly and i'm going to just very quickly go through what the journey might look like uh for a typical player and this is a, a slide that both myself and my colleague Park McDonald show to parents and show to coaches uh, when we're delivering coach education courses or, or coaching workshops and really the ultimate aim uh, of this slide I guess and, and, and the point we want to get across is to as coaches to help our players navigate their way through, through the journey and help them reach their full potential and that starts from when they come into our nursery at, at five years of age and hopefully we get them right through um, through our, our club program and they get a chance to reach their full potential, whether that, that's at, the, at the, the senior adult level or whether that's at the, at the recreational level. But I guess to, 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 to borrow the phrase from the GA, we ultimately want them to play and stay with, with the GA. So what does the journey look like? First of all, it's about enjoying that journey and, and players having a positive experience and coaches having a positive experience uh, within the GA club. So they'll come in, come in at nursery and and from the nursery they'll, they'll go on to play their goal games from under 8 to under 12. And I guess, look at I know in some counties this journey can look slightly different, but by and large um, it's along the same pathway. At 12, 13, 14 they're introduced maybe to, to competition and competitive leagues and competitive championships uh, right through um, along the, the rest of their pathway. And part of that journey they might represent a development squad. If they go to college, they might be on. Along that journey, they'll have to balance their, their education commitments. So there's a big transition from primary to secondary school where players maybe are, are leaving a, you know, a, an environment where they're very familiar with and very comfortable with and going into a completely new environment. And you know, as coaches, are there ways that, that we can help them with, with that transition? They'll have uh, more commitments maybe at, at junior certificate level in terms of their studies and again at, at leave insert. Some of them might, e might even have part-time jobs. So really the point we're trying to get across here is how can we help them get a balance in their lives between, we call them the three S's, their, their sport, their, their social life and, and their studies. And it's, it's not a matter of maybe giving up your, your sport to completely focus on your studies or giving up your social life, completely uh, focus on your sport. It's really about helping our players find the balance. And I guess re really the point we're trying to make here, it's about the long-term development and it's about, it's about the journey. It's not a sprint, it's definitely a marathon. Moving on from that, this is just a, a player pathway that, that we've um, adopted um, in the club. And it's used as a reference point, really, and a good guide for our coaches uh, when we have to look at the areas that we need to focus on when developing our players. And, and you'll see, you'll see within the pathway, there are five stages to the pathway. Starting from the fundamental stage all the way up to uh, the training to win stage. And within those, within those five stages, there are six phases. I'm just. That's great. Uh, there are six phases, and starting with the physical literary skills, and we've seen all the research uh, on those. Uh, our technical skills, our tactical skills, our mental or psychological skills, our physical skills, and then our lifestyle. So within within each stage, there's areas that we need to work on as coaches to help our players develop in e in each of those phases. And again, it's a great reference point um, when we're looking at maybe what we should be coaching. Uh, I'm sure there's some coaches coaching at maybe at, at the under-8 level and maybe at, at the under-16 level. 
and the focus can be can be you know completely different. So the pathway helps us uh, guide that focus. So just moving on from that, having looked at what the journey looks like from, from the player's perspective and indeed the coach's perspective, having maybe uh, become aware of maybe what the areas as coaches that, that we need to to look at when we're coaching our players, it can inform us when we're pu- putting together our, our club coaching program or our club coaching model. And maybe what are the things you need to consider when you're looking to, to develop your, your overall club coaching model? And this is, again, this can be this can be adapted uh, to suit the, the needs of your club. But some of the areas that you might want to focus on when you're looking to develop an overall coaching program, you might want to look at your school's program. And, and really, you're looking at, at a connection with your schools, building that club-school connection. Uh, and for example, I know maybe in some clubs you might have somebody who, who's retired or maybe a student who, who might have time to go in and assist with, with the coaching in, in the local primary school because you really want to build that sense of connection within the community between your club and your school. Uh, that might look like in the form of sharing facilities, for example, or maybe the school will allow you to go in and promote club activities uh, and club events within that school. Ultimately, for a lot of clubs, the schools are, you know, I guess the recruitment grounds for for the club. And really, you want to, as a GA club, you need to be establishing yourself, you know, in your local schools. The next, uh, I guess, area you might want to look at is your nursery. The nursery is a really important area because it's the first introduction to uh, the GA club from the child and the parents' perspective. And you need to make sure that inter- introduction is a, is a really positive one. Uh, and the environment you set within the nursery should be all about fun and it should be a friendly environment. If you're looking at the key coaching focuses there, it's really about fundamental movement skills. And again, physical literacy skills, you've, we've seen all the research recently from, from Stephen Bean and, and DCU in terms of how important developing physical literacy or movement skills are. But we all, we're also getting a chance to develop that connection and that sense of belonging um, to the club for both the parent and the child. Maybe it's their first time being involved in the GA club and you really want to make sure it's a positive experience. Some of the other strands you look at are, 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 the, are the child strand. And we talk about the child strand, we talk about from under eight up to under 12. And again, you're still trying to build on that connection, build on that sense of belongingness. You're trying to, I guess, win the hearts and minds of, of children uh, and make, make sure that they keep coming back to the GA club. Uh, some of the coaching folks, again, you're looking at developing their technical skills. Can we have bilateral players? Can they kick off both feet by the time they get to 12? Can they strike on both sides? Can they catch? Can they can they lift? Can they pass? Can they do all those skills? Uh, also, it's a, continu- a continuation on from the, the fundamental movement skills, which are, again, we know from research, are the, the building blocks of any uh, athlete and really they should be continued on. The environment just said certainly at, at, you know when you're coaching children should be one again that's that's fun, that's friendly, but it's also optimally challenging because children want to be challenged. But as a coach we need need to know you know the balance between over challenging them and just the right challenge. And again you really want to, an environment where they can come down to your session and aren't afraid to fail, aren't afraid to make mistakes. Continuing on into the youth level, again, it's just a it's just a, a continuation on from developing their skills under pressure. You might go into tactical and team play development. Uh, you might increase their, their functional competence, and a, and a great a great resource in the GA is the GA fifteen, um, and it shows you how you how you can include good movement good movement patterns in a warm up, and include the ball. Bear in mind, we just looked at the youth and we looked at the journey. As part, as part of your youth coaching, you have players who will have to deal with maybe studies, the pressures of studies, the pressure of, pressures of exams, maybe they'll have part-time jobs, maybe they're on development squad teams, maybe they're playing other sports. And again, as a coach, you're, you're not trying to put more pressure and put more, uh, fill up their, their, their load even more. You're trying to really help them with that balance and take that pressure off. Again, I'm just going to very, very quickly touch on the coach education bit. If we have if we have a player pathway, we should really have you know a coaching pathway for our coaches. Um, if we have better coaches, we're going to have better players. And you know when we're coaching Gaelic games at this level, you know the the, the minimum 
require it now is a, is a foundation level uh, coaching award, and every every club in the country should be you know adhering to that, and should the ambition should be if you're going to coach in the GA club that at the minimum you have that award. Uh, and again, there's a good structure within the G of 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 the the formal coach education award from the foundation award, from, uh, leading on to the award one, Charlie Luton adult, and even the award two. But you might also look at some informal coach education in the co- in the in the in the in the form of coaching forums, uh, and maybe bringing in some guest coaches into your club to focus on the areas that you that you feel as a club that that, that need to be developed. <clears throat> Uh, I have attached uh, at the end of this presentation some some links to resources that will help you, you know, fill in the content um, in each of those areas in terms of tactical and and technical technical development. So there's lots of content out there that clubs can use um, when we're looking at at, at developing our players. Uh, really, if you're if you're looking to develop your coaching model, maybe just start with one. Maybe start with with one element and start developing that. And when that's up and running, you might move on to the next phase. Uh, if you could try to try to maybe some clubs, ha- I'm sure most clubs ha- have have these areas uh, well established. But if you don't, maybe just pick one area and and, and start with that. Uh, just moving on then to sustainability, and I think that's I've put up a couple of maybe funny graphs just for you to, to have a look at. But in some clubs, maybe coaching can be left to just one person, i.e. the coaching officer. And if that's the case, it's really not going to work. Um, for this to be sustainable, there has to be a structure. And, we, uh, and that structure might be in the form of for you know putting together a juvenile committee or a juvenile coaching committee or an adult coaching committee or, have, or having both. Or maybe, maybe you're going to let the coaching officer in your club lead um, lead the way, but assist them, assist that person in the form of maybe establishing a, a nursery officer in your club or a, a child coaching officer in your club or a youth and adult coach, and maybe establishing a schools coach or maybe putting somebody in charge of coach education. But then there's a structure around that, and you can also set targets. So maybe, maybe you'll want to retain. Hopefully, you can retain all your players throughout the course of the season and retain all your coaches. But maybe you look at the end of the season, how many players did we retain? How many coaches did we, did we retain? Maybe you're going to look at setting targets in terms of coach education. Maybe you want to set so many, maybe you want to have you know so many people through the foundation award or through the award one. Maybe, uh, maybe you want to run a coaching forum. Maybe you've identified areas of of um, coaching deficiencies in your club and you can, you can bring in a guest coach. So it's about having a structure to do all that. And really what it's about is about putting coaching on the agenda. And I know most clubs, you know, between fundraising and development, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on and, 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 and it costs a lot of money. But really, you know, you need to, if you want coaching to work in your club, you really have to invest in coaching and making sure it's on the agenda at every court, at every juvenile meeting, at, at every adult meeting, and you're setting you're setting targets for yourself and your coaches in those meetings. A good example of maybe you know I'll, I'll use my example of my home club in Galway, um, who recently engaged with their county coaching and games development uh, committee and wanted to establish their own club coaching program. And this is a small rural club in Galway, I think with 170 70 members. So they got. 30 to 40 volunteers in a room. The county, someone from the county coaching and games committee came out, facilitated that meeting. They all had a chat about where they felt they were they were at as a club in terms of coaching, and then put together some some work groups to establish things like uh, a nursery program uh, and a player pathway and a coaching committee. And they've successfully done that, in, you know, in a in a short space of time, but it. If that was left to just one person, that's very, very hard for one person to do. So if we're talking about sustainability, the first thing we need to do is make sure coaching is on the agenda and it's well supported within the clubs and and it's invested in. I'm not going to talk too much uh, around this slide, but really the point I want to make uh, is that if we're looking at a, a fully 
functioning club, maybe what does it look like? I guess the, the you know the key asset of any club is his people, and people make clubs work. Uh, and if you have people who you know volunteers who are helping to raise volunteers who are coaching and playing, who are on committees, uh, who are who are assisting in, in other areas in terms of establishing a, a quality game, quality coaching, um, age-appropriate coaching, interlinking with your schools and forming that uh, community link with your schools. But the point is that you know people people are the real asset in the club. Uh, players, coaches, volunteers, people who sit on committees, and that's what clubs need to invest on. And if we can do that, well, then you have a greater chance of, of, of sustaining your coaching program in the future. Um, okay, just moving on from that in the short term, and I'm going to spend maybe the next 13, 14 minutes on this because we find ourselves in a, in a, like a strange situation where we can't engage with our players on the pitch and uh, we're, we're all in lockdown and I guess we're, we're in very, very uncertain times. Uh, and it, what can we do as coaches in the short term maybe to sustain our coaching program and to engage with our players? And there's been some ideas that, club, you know, that clubs have, have come up with and they've been excellent. And I'll, I'll talk through some of them in a few minutes. If you were to flip this on, 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 on the positive side, you know, it's probably a great opportunity for, for us as coaches and maybe as a club to self-reflect. Uh, if you're looking at your club coaching program or if you're looking at yourself as a coach, where are we as a club in terms of our coaching or where am I as a coach? Why do I coach? Uh, have your motivations changed as a coach? Have they stayed the same? Maybe look at your own strengths as a coach. When you coach, what do you feel that you're really competent at? And is there an opportunity now for you to improve in certain areas? And that might, you know, there's plenty of podcasts and books and, and resources out there that coaches can read up on, and online courses that coaches can, can get on to, 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 to improve, improve their coaching. Maybe it's, now it's a good time to ask, ask your players what they think of you as a coach maybe ask your players and you know as a club ask your coaches how they feel about the club and maybe where they feel uh, coaching stands uh, in the overall aspect of the club i guess ultimately the short term maybe we can look at how, how can we become a better coach and how can we engage with our players over the next four to six or eight ten weeks I've attached uh, on the slide, uh, on the presentation, a uh, uh, self-reflection coaching, coaching questionnaire. And if you're looking to upskill, maybe it might be an idea to, to fill up that questionnaire. And it, it first of all, identifies what you're good at, maybe in areas that you might want to upskill on. This is a, an example of, again, I'll just use Kilmer Crokes as, as an example. These were our under nine coach, coaches uh, a couple of months back. They wanted to get some feedback on their coaching and I guess their coaching environment for, for, for the players. So they put together a simple Google Docs form and they sent it out to the parents and they asked the parents to fill, uh, fill this out um, with the input from the child. So they asked the child the question and um, along with, with the help of the parents, uh, they'd get the answer. So there's some really interesting questions uh, that the coaches asked. Uh, and if you look at the third column and the question was asked, what is fun for your son? And a lot of them, the answer that came back was again, games, blitzes, meeting friends. Uh, they mentioned some of the games that, that they like playing. Uh, interestingly, you know, winning out of 51 participants in, 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 in that, that completed the survey, you know, winning was, was a long way down. And what they asked, the question below that name one thing that your son would like coaches to do more of and again you can imagine the answer that came back it was more games more blitzes uh and and uh i think that just was it was a nice way of of i guess you know interacting engaging with the players this might be something that you can do as the coach or maybe as a club 
get some feedback in terms of from your players or from your volunteers or from your team in relation to your coaching and how you can plan for that uh, when we all do get back on the field coaching with our players. So again, this is just the, again, uh, continuing on from the, the short term. In the middle here, we have, I guess, the, the player development wheel. And you can see different slices of the pie in terms of as coaches where we need to develop our players on. Some of, some of the ideas that we've seen clubs and coaches do in the last couple of weeks have been the weekly skill challenges. And they're you know really effective because ultimately it's a way of engaging with your players. And ultimately it's a way about you know ensuring that when we're all trying to establish a new routine, where we've all been knocked out of our, our daily routine. It's about ensuring that GEA stays in the routine if it, if it, if it, <clears throat> it's a coach if you're used to coaching on a Tuesday and Thursday and the player is used to training on a Tuesday and Thursday maybe can we still fit that routine uh, in, into that weekly calendar and the skill challenges are, are a nice way of, of, of doing that and encouraging players to practice their skills uh, at home in the back garden some of the weekly session plans again I've seen some co coaches and out are excellent uh, they include descriptions of of the activities or the games, and some of them have even included some YouTube clips and some uh, clips from Twitter or social media in terms of how this skill or activity can be completed. And they're all great ways uh, of, again, just engaging uh, with your player and engaging, even engaging with your fellow coaches. So what else can we do? So to influence, when we look at the player development wheel, how can we influ influence their even more over the next few weeks, their, their tactical developments, their team play development, their physical or psychological, how can we educate them on their lifestyle? So I'm just going to throw at you a few ideas um, that I've started to use, and uh, hopefully you'll get something from that. Uh, Brendan Harper was on last week and did a brilliant presentation on player profiling. I think it's crucially important that you know every coach, and Brendan recommended from 14 upwards, um, is probably an ideal time to, to start uh, player profiling. Uh, it's always left in the long finger because it, it takes time. And if we have nothing else over the next few weeks, we have time to, to, to player profile. The benefits of player profiling, as you know, Brendan outlined last week, it creates a huge, you know, it creates a, it creates a self-awareness uh, within the player of, of, first of all, what they're good at, areas that they're strong on, and maybe areas that they could improve on. It's a great way of starting a conversation. And again, if you're going to, whatever form of communication you're using, if that's email or whatever way you're, you're using to, you're using to communicate with players, if you can send, a, it's a great way of starting a conversation and all you need to do is send out the form, get back the form, and then it's a nice way of, of, of opening up that conversation. It also builds a great understanding between the coach and the player. It helps the player understand maybe where your perspective um, and hopefully as a coach, you'll greatly better understand the player's perspective when it comes to maybe technical development or tactical development or why these areas are important. Most importantly with the player profiling, those, it, it develops an action plan. And as a coach, we can help a player develop an action plan over the next few weeks. And again, that, that's another way of keeping them engaged uh, while we can't go on the pitch and, and coach them. Uh, Brendan had a had a had a brilliant uh, uh, player profiling sheet he showed last week. Mine is very very similar. <clears throat> There's a couple of subtle differences. I, I need to credit this to Colin Clear from Leinster GA. Um, I took this off him and I, I use it um, when we were player profiling some of the, the leash players earlier on the year. And again, it has some some of the same the same headings as, as Brendan's. As Brendan's um, sheet showed last week, again, we've seven, seven or eight areas in terms of technical, defensive, running, attacking play, psychological focus, components of physical fitness and game understanding. So I've just filled in some numbers randomly to give an example of, of what this looks like. If you look up at the top heading where the name is, and then you'll see player PRI, player score, coach PRI and coach score. And this is where the conversation can get really interesting if you can get this data from the players. The player PRI stands for the player's perceived rate of that's perceived rate of importance. So, how important does the player perceive that skill to be in relation to his own game? So, if you look at first touch, for example, and I've just thrown in some numbers here. In this case, the player perceives 
the first touch, he gave it out of 10, a score of 5. So he doesn't think it's that important. In saying that, he's given himself or herself a score out of 9. The coach PRI, I put that in as 5. Most, most coaches will, will, will put a first touch in, in at a 9 or a 10 because whether you're playing Gaelic football, ladies football, hurling or camogie, your first touch is, is crucial. And the, interestingly, the coach has scored the player first touch as five so straight away you see a big difference between the nine the nine the five but as brendan said last week if you're starting that conversation it's better to start the conversation on something the player is good at uh, and open the conversation on a you know in a positive sense what this excel sheet workbook does and i've attached to the presentation so you can go and look at it look at it in your own time um you can create a spider graph and you can see if you see, uh, let's look at, at the technical aspect. And within within the within the Excel sheet, at the bottom there are different subheadings: technical, defensive, tacking. And if you click into each of those, a different spider graph comes up. But let's look at look at a technical, for example, and uh, all the scores have been color coded. So the player's PRI is in blue, the player's score is in orange, the coach PRI is in grey, and the coach score is on yellow. So straight away. You can see the gaps between the coach's score, which is the yellow, and the player's score, which is an orange. And let's just take the first touch, and you can see you can see the gap. And again, very very quickly, if you can see that, and if that's information that you've gotten back before you have the conversation with the player, it can inform your questioning, and it can help plan for a better conversation. Because the point being is that now is a great opportunity for us as coaches to go and work with our players and help them develop an action plan over the next few weeks and, and keep keep them motivated and keep them engaged and help them become more competent. And that might be, you might decide that you might uh, have an online conversation or a phone call after you've got the data back from the player. You might do four players a week and over the course of four or five weeks, you more than likely will have will have, will have had a chat with, with every player within that squad and they'll all have had you know, a, t- a time to chat with their coach and develop an action plan that they can work on at home or in the back garden uh, in the short term. Another, uh, we, we, we're talking about you now the use of, of technology and, and how it can help our coaching in the short term. This, this is a, an app, a free, applica- a free app I use. It's called Tactical Pad, and it's it's a it's a great application if you're teaching, if you're trying to coach uh, things like movement or. Tactic, tactical or team play elements of the game or thing or ways that you'd like your players to play so i'm just going to quickly click here and give an example of what tactical pad does visually it's a great coaching tool uh, for players so if you're looking to coach inside movement for example um you can maybe give players examples of what that move might move might, might look like if it's kick out or poke out strategies you know again it, you can mark out the areas or if you're looking for a player to play deep Again, it, it, it has all those features. How can we use tactical pads as an example to engage our players uh, and to even further develop their tactical and team play development? Well, here's a slide. Uh, here's might be an exercise that you might give to your players um, over the next few weeks. And these are all problems that players encounter and coaches encounter when we're playing matches. Uh, whether it's defenders being dragged all over the place by forwards, forwards uh, shooting from difficult positions or forwards bunching uh, when the ball is going in. It might be an idea maybe to give these tasks out to your players and ask them to come back with what they, what they feel their solutions might be. They might, download, they might download Tactical Pad and send you on their solutions through Tactical Pad or you know, uh, you might use tactical pad to to maybe show what the best option might be. You might even have a competition and have a prize for for some of the best options the players give back to you. Ultimately, it's about it's about it's a different way of engaging players and giving them autonomy. We want our players to be able to make decisions for themselves in the pitch. We want our players to take ownership on the pitch, and you know, this might be a first step over the next few weeks on how you can do that, giving them tasks. Give it, giving them problem, uh, problem solving um, ideas and asking them to come back to you with, with solutions. Uh, again, we're nearly up uh, time-wise, so I'm 
going to fly through the rest of it very, very quickly. Uh, another coaching tool that's, that's used, I'm sure, by many coaches is, is this thing called freeze framing. And how does freeze framing work? Well, on the left, we have, we have a, a player who's gone in to dispossess their opponent. And we're, if we're, it's a great way of showing players maybe what good technique might look like. And especially if you're looking, if you're working with, with younger players or younger children, it can be a nice way to engage um, or send through their parents some photos or shots of what good practice looks like. And it gives them a picture in, 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 in their head and when they're looking to execute the skill, what, what, what that might uh, be. Um, again, another idea, I got this through uh, Philip Kerr and uh, uh, Philip uses an app called Huddle Technique, which I'll cover in a second. And I suppose, like every coach, you're kind of you're you're stealing their, everybody's ideas and, and you're and you're putting them to use yourself. But this is uh, another way of using freeze framing. I'm going to play this clip here very very quickly, and this is just a match. And this is a uh, this is you might send your players a clip, and you might ask them in that clip, okay, what's the option with the player in possession? What's, and at this stage, his only option is to keep going. But you might have different snapshots in games of players in possession or not in possession. And you might, again, a bit like the task I showed earlier, ask them to come back to you with maybe what they would do in that position. And again, how you engage with that, again, it can be it, it, it can be through the di your different forms of communication that, that you're using with your teams at, at the moment. Um you might also send them some some good YouTube clips. Maybe you're working on a certain element of, of in your team play. It might be you know a good forward movement, or it might be good distribution. You might find clips in YouTube and send them to your players to give them to give them a picture of of what it looks like. And you might ask them to work on you know certain skills that they need to get better at. To execute execute some of those scenarios. Again, I'm just going to move on to another another app, another piece of technology you can use. And I first come, came across this when Philip Kerr came down to the club and he delivered a, a brilliant coaching workshop uh, to our coaches. But um, he was really at the time focused on, in, you know, how can we really break down coaching and really coach the uh, individual? And one of the piece, the piece of technology he used was, was Huddle Technique. And Huddle Technique is a free app you can download, and it's it's absolutely fantastic. So because it gives you a, a split screen of maybe somebody like Tommy Walsh, for example, on, on the right who who can show striking from the hand and what best practice looks like, and then somebody on the on the left, such as a one of our our Komogi players who's just beginning the game and learning to strike from the hand, and it allows you. I'll just play it here so you can see what it looks like. So again, and again, you can freeze and move. And when you go onto the app, you're able to draw and add comments and you're able to identify matching points and miss matching points. The question is, how can we use that with our, with our players over the short term? Well, maybe, you know, it might be an idea for, for a parent you're engaging with, maybe new to the sport, new to Gaelic games. Uh, they might be able to record their child extra from the skill. They can send it on to you and you can give them feedback and send it back to the parents. Again, it's a different way of communicating and a different way of coaching over the next eight, ten weeks. And, and Huddle Technique, you know, allows you to do all that. It also might be for a free taker in your club. If it's looking at good kicking technique or good striking technique or good body position. Again, if a, a, an adult player, for example, or, you know, a minor player is looking to improve some of those special skills they can record themselves and send those clips on to you. So again, it's just, a, I, I, it's about thinking outside the box and it's about thinking, how can I engage my player? How can I uh, keep developing my coaching uh, in, in the short term? There are just uh, links to some useful resources um, that you can you can click in and use and look at it in your own time. It'll help fill the content if you're looking to, to establish a, you know, a, an adult, a, a child strand, uh, coaching in your in your club or a youth strand coaching and maybe some of the some of the things you might want to include are some some brilliant resources uh, in some of those uh, links and and uh, I'm sure hopefully you'll get something from them. I suppose some some of the the key take home points in relation to the presentation. Um, if you need to if you're going to establish a 
a really sustainable uh, coaching program. Uh, clubs need to start put putting coaching on the you know on the agenda. If that's in the form of a, a juvenile coaching committee, if that's in in the form of establishing their own club coaching committee and setting themselves little targets and little aims um, that they want to achieve, and you'll find very very quickly as as a club that there's a lot of things that that you're doing well. Uh, the schools might be going well. And uh, maybe the the, the child's uh, focus might be going well, but maybe you might need to do a, a bit of work on 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 maybe the youth. But having some sort of a evaluation system in place for your coaching program, so so you know what's working and what's not working, and having some targets in place that you can that you can reach, because like like us all, we all need to be motivated and all we all need to be encouraged, and setting little targets uh, can really can really help with that motivation in the short term it's really about engaging uh with the player and i was down the shop last week and i met one of our under uh, 15 coaches and i asked him how how were they how were they getting on and he was saying to me look struggling to get to get the young fella out of the bed but at the same time he was up to 15 chin-ups so uh you know even 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 the point being that if we can find ways to, to engage our players, set them targets, encourage them to keep keep developing, they will. Uh, so when we do get back on the field, um, we will we will be in a better position as coaches. We'll be better organised. Maybe we have got it. We'll, we'll have got time to self reflect and upskill, and our players will have kept developing in in in, in certain areas of, of the, the the player developmental wheel. Uh, that's uh, okay. I hope I I uh, I covered everything. I think I've covered everything. Um, thanks for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions um, of anybody if, if they have some. So over to you, Peter. Thanks very much, Niall. Thanks for that presentation. Very very clear. Lots of really really good simple ideas for all of us to take um, to take on board. Um, for for those of you that have any questions to ask. On Teams here, when you roll your mouse over in the middle of the screen, you can see um, a few icons pop up. One of those is a little speech bubble, and it's a show conversation or a chat. So if you want to type in any question that you have there, um, and, and I can ask Niall each of the questions rather than, than using the microphones, if that's okay. Niall, Barry Dunn in Waterford just asking, is Huddle free or a paid app? Uh, it's 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 a free app to download, and there's certain features you can use for free. And there's, an, there's enough free features you can use that 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 that, you, that, will you, that will help you to engage with your player. You can subscribe to it, and it'll give you additional features. But the app is free to download. Thanks, Niall. I'd say we have about 10, 15 minutes or so for questions. If if people want to just type in their own, um, there's there's no no issue at all. Um, Niall, just um, Maybe for myself, some, some questions. Obviously, technology can be really, really good for coaches. Um, but, you know, uh, may, maybe for, for our experience here in the last couple of weeks is not everyone's broadband has really been hectic for, for sending these things around. So um, is, is there anything, have you encountered any issues with, with, with some coaches or really good ideas that some, some of your club coaches come up with for those? Um, well... I, I suppose uh, the the smartphone is, is is a nice way of uh, you know recording recording skills or recording sessions and um, sending them on to the parent or uh, sending sending them that way I guess through 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 your smartphone uh, some some of our coaches again have sent out emailed out great session plans through the through, through the parents in terms of. Uh, what players can be doing and have found great YouTube clips and clips from Twitter that uh, that that identify what the activity is and, and how the players can can execute it. So yeah, they're, they're kind of some some of the things that um, our coaches have been using. Some of the things that, that I've seen. The skill challenges are are obviously a great a great idea, but how sustainable they are over the next few weeks, you know, um, we'll have to wait and see. Um. Yeah, Kevin Kelly, question here. Kevin from Ulster, you might know. Um, he, he's like Crokes is a massive club, so a huge number yeah. of players. How many games are you trying to get for every player per year? Just as a sort of rough idea, and roughly how long would you like? Would you think the season would be? Yeah, well, 
I suppose it's, it's slightly different in Dublin where the summer is a bit quieter uh, in Dublin where in, down the country um, games are in full flow. But let's just take the, the goal games, for example, the CCC, CCC one. Uh, if if our, if our players, which a lot of our players are dual players, they'll get in goal games alone, they'll get 26, 26 games in the year. And and then we'll we'll have football festivals, hurling, camogie festivals. Uh, we'll have trips away, and uh, there'll be more games onto that. If you look at the older age groups, uh, for example, our under 14s, they'll they'll get um, dual players will get uh, 14, 14 games in terms of league, and again they'll have the fail of blitz, or they might have they might have championships, and again they'll they'll use away trips. So they have a huge amount of games. Uh, I'm not sure what what the structure is in, in, in other counties, but you know the games program in Dublin is is, is quite good. How would you try and encourage mentors um, in your role as a GPO to attend to develop their coaching and attend workshops and courses and things like that? Well, the first thing you might do is maybe maybe just uh, audit your coaches and find out what they're interested in. Uh, what are the things that that they find interesting? You know, asking their motivation. So why are they coaching? Is it because maybe their their little girl or little boy is involved in coaching? But maybe what else do you like about coaching? So maybe asking the question. Well, maybe what workshops would you, would you like to go on? What what forums would you like to throw on? Again, some of the examples, some of the things that that both Porik and myself organising coach would be, and you know, an, an annual coaching forum where we where we bring in guest guest speakers and guest coaches and to give their perspective on coaching and on different topics within coaching there are so many strands of coaching nowadays but it's about really keeping everybody engaged and having somebody for everybody so the january forum has worked well and you know through the course of the year we've had or the last few years we've had people like mick bowen and philip Kerr and like christy o'connor uh we've michael fenley so these all add to i guess when coaches see these these coaches coming into the club that it can help them engage more in, in the coaching process a couple of questions are, are sort of very um are coming through from a few different people so um very similar questions i should say so more or less um the, the profiling of players that you spoke about there um would you keep a record of those over time so you might have built it up over the years from 14 to 16 to minor and, onward, and onwards yeah, well, to, to be honest, I haven't. When I when I came across Colm's column clear sheet, there it was it was pre Christmas, and uh, I've started using it with the leash guys. But I I wouldn't have really done it up, up to that if I'm being honest. But I I think you should because if we're looking at, at the development of a player, I think it's it's really good um, to have that information. Um, what what we do, what's useful that clubs might do uh, uh, we have handover evenings at the end of at the end of the year so where coaches get a chance to sit down and uh, for example the under 12 coach might sit down with the under 11 coach and say this is what I did through the year this, this is the, the activities I did the games I played uh, the, the, the festivals I went to here's what worked for me here's what didn't work and it's a great way of I guess creating that community of practice so coaches get a chance to share information, to share ideas, to swap ideas, to find out what worked for the coach ahead of them, what didn't work. Um, go back to the player profiling thing. Um, we've kind of done a small bit of analysis and more some more some stuff in the, in the football where we've looked at uh, the player at under 12 and his progression through minor. So at under 12, for example, that player might have been, you know, uh, a B player or even a C player. And what we're finding, by the time we get to minor, we're getting three or four players who are who were once maybe a B or C player at 11 or 12 are suddenly a minor A player. And we probably need to do a bit more work into that to see maybe <clears throat> how it's coming through. But I've no doubt that the game program is helping, um, that players are getting games and they are developing. But uh, if you had a, a player profiling sheet for a player from 14 and then you know, you kept that log up until minor. I think that that's fantastic information. To have. Um, a couple of questions again, and William Harmon is one, and and uh, it's the name down here is Modern Harps Ladies Football. Um, 
is about how often are, should coaches engage with young players at the moment, considering, um, first of all, for, for young players that have to go through the parents, and second of all, a lot of parents will be fairly overwhelmed with what's going on in general, maybe having to work from home and so on, as well as everything else. Yeah, look, I suppose it probably depends really, isn't it? I, I think your last point there is really relevant, that um, players or parents are having to deal with so much with maybe with working from home with children not being in school and, and are completely trying to establish a new routine and suddenly you're throwing all it all from a coaching perspective information at them they, they overwhelmed and it can actually you know it can really demotivate the, the parents so look maybe once a week is probably enough to, to engage um with with your team or with your players and you're giving them maybe a a program of work for that week and stuff if you through look at it for for older players it might be through a, a skype call for adults and for younger players you you know you might chat to the parents or send this that 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 uh of the program of work that you like them to do for the week so maybe generally like once a week but i i think the crucial thing is that you, that you, that the, that the the ga is kept in the in the daily routine or or, or the weekly calendar uh so so they're not getting used to maybe look at a, I used to train on a Thursday or coach on a Thursday that's gone for eight weeks and suddenly we're back and suddenly they've established anything. So it's about really keeping uh, Gaelic games in their in their weekly calendar, I guess, Peter. Um, thanks, Niall. Just a, a couple of more. Um, one, uh, Donald Hogan here is looking at, at how you might generate those skill challenges on video that challenge stronger kids without stressing out the weaker kids. Say it again, Peter. So, that, for example, that. if you're if you're if you're creating a, maybe a skills challenge or a, uh, for for your players maybe on video or or, or use some, using something else, yeah. you want to set it that that obviously the the stronger kids are challenged and stretched a little bit, but not but also not overwhelm the slightly weaker kids. Yeah, um, and again, it depends how you set the challenge. Uh, you might have, I know with with some with with uh, with some of our. Um, coaches they're they're having skill challenges within the within their own age groups and, and part of what they're doing is that they're having you know different categories they'll they'll give a prize for effort they'll give a prize for for a good kick or a good strike they'll give a they'll give a prize for creativity so maybe that's a way of to create the, to create those different different levels uh, i again attached to this presentation are are the 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 cross can awards the skills test that we use uh, for our player, someone under eight, under twelve, or maybe using the goal games challenges uh, as a way, because in, in those challenges there are different levels. Uh, in those challenges, that that a player can 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 achieve and also can can find you know optimally challenging. It comes back to really if you're if you're going to design those skill challenges, you need you need to really know your players and what level they're at and, and what they can and can't do, and maybe you need to come up with a a, a method or a way of maybe having you know, a series of challenges for, you know, your your weaker players, but but letting everyone try those challenges. Maybe having a series of series of challenges for your stronger players and letting everyone try those challenges, so everyone feels that they can do something. Thanks, Niall. And just for everyone to know, a number of people are asking questions. Yes, all the resources that Niall has spoken about here are available, uh, and they will be on the the GA Learning site after this session. Um, and and. Thanks very much to, to Niall and Croaks for sharing those. Uh, I know a lot, an awful lot of work went into to producing them, so uh, it's great to share it amongst the community. Just a couple of questions about maybe more organisational stuff in, in clubs and, and getting the Croaks experience, Niall, um, about whether coaches stay with their, their own age groups or do they follow on for, for, for a variety of years, for example, from under eight up to minor, for, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Crokes, most of the, most of the coaches will will stay with their team. Um, but I know, for example, with with in in football, you know, at, at thirteen or fourteen onwards, that uh, the coaches alternate. So uh, that the coach isn't coaching his son or daughter, and th that takes time to develop because you're. You, you're looking at most coaches. If they have a, a child involved or a player involved, they'll want to stay with that team. And if they've brought them all the way up from nursery, they'll they'll, they'll want to stay with them. Um, but it, we're kind of we're, interestingly we're doing a, a project on we're trying to implement a, a psychological pathway uh, in the club from 13 to 18. And we've got the help of 
Anya McNamara and DCU. And I'm um, some of the some of the research that she's given us is that it's good for players to experience different coaches um, because th- th- they can uh, they're able then to 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 communicate and they're able to get a different experience or a different perspective from a coach. So it's something that we're trying to implement in the club that our players are getting different experiences because like, like most clubs, you've, you've, you've coaches who, who might be brilliant at, at t- coaching striking or coaching kicking, or you might have coaches who are brilliant at athletic development. And it's about getting our players exposed to as many of those coaches rather than staying with the one coach all the way up along. Um, so to answer the question, we're, we're we're trying to go that way, but that takes time. And uh, look, it takes it takes a, a lot of communication and understanding from co- from coaches, but it can be done. Thanks, Niall. Um, Owen Bernock in Waterford is is asking about juvenile players and whether they're dual in the club, um, and how the seasons operate. Then are they split season or same time, and whether you have different coaches uh, for hurling and football groups and and the sort of planning that goes on between that. That's that's a lot in one go, but. Yeah, I'll see. Can I take it all? Uh, yeah, we, ninety ninety percent of our players, certainly juvenile, are are dual players. So uh, six seven years ago, we introduced uh, a dual nursery for the first time in the club, where where uh, players came down and uh, had an hour of hurling football and fundamental movement skills, <clears throat> and as a result of that, uh, both the player and the coach have and the parents have have got into coaching both codes and there really is no difference uh, you know 70 80 percent of our coaches now are, are dual coaches whereas before that wouldn't have been the case be, be, but because it's all they know and when they come into the club it it it, 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 it was uh it was a, a, a you know a combined effort and ladies football and camogie have gone the same way and yeah, it's 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 really positive because there's there's a there's a huge amount of uh, the teams are big. The, the it's a it's a it's a each age group has, you know, nearly nearly a hundred players, and you can imagine the organization the organization in that. So the games program in, from Go Games they play they play um they play every second week. So they'll, they'll or if they're dual players they'll play every Saturday in the Go Games, and over the course of the year they'll get. 26 to 28 games not including some of the the blitzes we play outside of that the some so they'll play the goal games from february or march up until up until maybe june and then they'll go back uh, and play goal games from august to october so uh, in terms of uh, the games there's a huge opportunity to play to play um, those games thanks Niall. um I think we're okay on, on the questions. I want to just say thanks to Niall Corcoran on behalf of all the people on the call today with over 200 people on this on this call. It was great to see. Um, last question, Cara Carberry, you just got in. How many sessions per week are your, are your lads training, roughly, would you suggest? Uh, so at, at the juvenile level, um, they'll, do, they'll do one hurling, one football. And on the Sunday mornings from a... From a from a hurling perspective, mainly to do to do one midweek session at the weekend, that we always put together an optional session on a Sunday morning or if it's a football on a sun on a Sunday afternoon where maybe players who aren't playing other sports can come down and kick a ball or strike a ball. So between between one and two a week, and then after that, then they're, they're, doing, they're doing two sessions a week. Perfect. Thanks, Niall. Um, again, like I suggested there, thanks on behalf of everyone here for, for your insight, for sharing your information, for sharing what you do in Croaks, um, and, and for giving us lots of great ideas that, that we might um, implement in our own clubs uh, as time goes on. Just for everybody to be aware, um, the registration form for the next of these sessions, which will take place next Tuesday evening, uh, with Owen Mooney. from Owen is from Fermanagh originally, but has actually just started working in Dublin, GA now as well. Um, that, that session will be on at 7.30 next Tuesday. Registration opens for that at, at 9 o'clock this evening on the same webpage that you registered on the last time. Please note that you do need to register each time because the link for each of the meetings is different. So if you register, to, for, if you register tonight and it's your first time registering, you do have to register again for, for the next session, but it's all managed from the same page. So, so that's just information for, for everybody involved. So thanks again, Niall. Um, and we want to wish you well for the rest of the year and hopefully we'll get back on the playing fields very, very soon. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Peter.